Hi there, guys. Uh, thanks for allowing me to sleep, uh, speak today. Uh, my name is Porv. Uh, my handle on the internet is uh, Toidu. Uh, that's how it's pronounced. And uh, today I want to talk about tips on writing a web server and beyond. And the beyond is hopefully some of these tips can be used um, beyond just writing a web server. Uh, so this is what I plan to talk on today. Uh, designing with lifetimes, uh, database management, logging, and uh, cord hardening tips. Um, and this URL is actually, um, I don't know if you can see that, actually. Ah, there we go, perfect. All right, so these are the things that we're gonna be talking about. Um, this is my information. Uh, it'll be presented later as well. And um, this uh, URL, uh, GitHub repo, is actually what this talk is sort of based on, and it's uh, working code, front end and back end, so if you wanna play around with it, look at more details, uh, please feel free to do so. Um, you can also contact me later on. Okay, so designing with lifetimes. Uh, one of the problems I've heard uh, people run into is they still don't know how to like sort of take the lifetime concept and design systems with it. Uh, it's still a, kind of a weird, maybe new problem. Uh, so I wanted to take a stab at um, looking at how I did it. And I didn't come to this solution at first, so we'll sort of work through the problem and then uh, see how it goes. So this is a sample uh, request in my system. Uh, and what it's doing is it's taking something from the internet, uh, it's parsing some query parameters, um, it's doing some middleware stuff, just looking at headers, authenticating. Uh, it's then uh, constructing some state that it needs, and it's doing that by hitting uh, the database and some external API, and then it's coming back with that and using some sort of algorithm to compute something useful, and then returning that back to the server uh, or the client. Um, so the way I thought about this is that let's just sort of go back out all the way, uh, take an overview, and then de uh, dive in, and then hopefully that can like help us sort of figure out what's going on. Uh, so this essentially is your web server in a black box. Um, I actually like to sort of uh, organize my code in such a way. So you have a server layer, you have a backend layer, and your data layer. Uh, the server layer is, again, going to just be responsible for sort of parsing your query parameters. The backend layer is going to be where your business logic should go. And the data layer is uh, what should be talking to your database or like external API and stuff. Um, so next, let's add uh, boundaries between these things. And uh, the dotted lines here represent uh, things that are borrowed, and the solid lines here represent things that are owned. So uh, if you look at this, it should become a little bit clearer why this is the case. So the server layer is spawning a function uh, in the backend layer, so that lives. The data layer is being spawned by the backend, so that lives. But when the data layer is returning the data back to the backend layer, uh, it sort of uh, goes out of existence, so it needs to pass the data back as an owned object. Uh, similarly, the backend layer needs to pass it back as an owned object um, when it's passing it back to the server layer. So according to this, it becomes kind of obvious that going down the uh, downflow, you need to maybe pass things as borrowed, but going back up, you need to pass them as owned objects. So if you add a little bit, a uh, couple of more components to this, the middleware and algorithm uh, and the external API, um, based on this, it might be obvious what these lines should look like. Uh, and that's what they look like. Because the middleware is in the same sort of uh, segment as a server layer, it can uh, use borrowed data. Uh, the algorithm, same way, it can just borrow data, possibly immutably. Um, and the external API, because it is sort of uh, crossing these interface boundaries or these system boundaries, uh, it needs to uh, at least return data uh, as an owned object. And then if we apply this to our, our request we saw previously, uh, it ends up, um, we draw our boundaries, and it ends up being um, that's the case. Um, and you don't have to read all of this now. You can look at the slides later. But uh, this is definitely not how I like design my system. This is I didn't go out and like draw the uh, diagram and like figure out this is what it needs to be. Um, it sort of came about after a lot of like sort of teasing at it. Um, but then after looking at it um, after it was done it seemed like this is probably a good approach to doing something if you're trying something new. Um, hopefully it works. Um, and uh, I think it's probably a better approach than like uh, just going at it and hopefully hoping it works. Cool, so next I wanna talk about database management. Um, 
So in my project, I decided to use uh, Postgres. And uh, one of the first things you should be doing, uh, in my opinion, is uh, setting up migrations. Uh, so people might be familiar with uh, Diesel. Uh, Diesel is a great ORM. Uh, there's actually a CLI component to it that lets you manage uh, migrations. Uh, and migrations, if you guys don't know or are familiar with, is essentially a way to migrate or uh, manage schemas for your database. Uh, you can also evolve. Uh, over time, maybe add a new table or uh, new columns. Um, also, since these migrations are code, you can then um, code review them uh, and hopefully also maybe use them for testing. And we'll actually be doing that later, you'll see. Uh, and all it's really doing is uh, in, in the actual database, it's creating a table where it's uh, keeping track of which migrations have been applied uh, or which have been reverted. And that lets you sort of see um, you can list them out and see like which where you are in the world of your migration. Cool. And the next question uh, I would beg that you might want to ask is: Should you be using an ORM or just opting for raw SQL? Um, and in terms of ORM, I'm going to be speaking primarily about Diesel. Um, uh, so Diesel is fantastic. It will actually validate and type check your like queries at compile time. Uh, that's huge, and as a Rust developer, that's probably what you want. Um, it will, however, um, uh, yeah, so actually well, what that does is it actually gets rid of a whole bunch of runtime uh, errors that you would otherwise have if you have a mistyped query. Uh, a con with that, however, in my opinion, and this doesn't apply to Diesel necessarily, is just an ORM is a, another framework that you have to learn. Uh, it's complex. Uh, it can be a whole lot of uh, learning curve. Um, and in my opinion, uh, in the past, I've run into this, uh, not necessarily with Diesel, is that if you try to some, do something very, very complex uh, that's maybe not supported by the ORM, you are going to spend a lot of time sort of churning and maybe hacking away at it uh, and possibly finding a solution. Um, on the other hand, with SQL, you can, uh, with raw SQL, you can obviously express the entire um, dialect there, so there's no sort of uh, abstraction that you need to work against or through. Uh, so it's extremely easy to express what you want here. Uh, a huge con with this is that you're now responsible for manually checking that your queries are actually like sane and like won't run time error. Um, and as an example, this is what my code used to look like. Maybe you can't see that. <laughs> but uh, basically what I'm doing at the select is that I'm actually listing all the column names myself. Um, I'm also listing the table name, and uh, at the bottom here, I'm actually uh, having to extract data by manually indexing into it. And those indexes need to match up exactly with uh, where I'm uh, querying them. So if they're sort of not aligned, this is going to just blow up in your face and cause a runtime error. Um, and additionally, uh, beyond just like sort of having an initial code that works or not, it's really hard to maintain. So imagine you are maybe adding a new uh, column table or uh, column and you need to query for additional parameters. You now need to change your code in at least two places. And since you're extracting this destruct, you're probably gonna need to change it in like a third place. Um, that just means it's gonna be extremely error prone and very, very difficult to maintain over time. So ideally, maybe we should be writing something like this. Um, and this essentially is uh, a user data struct and um, there are just two functions on this that are saying uh, SQL fields and SQL table. Um, and hopefully that just populates everything. And then user data, uh, there's a function exposed on it from Postgres row, and hopefully that just extracts what it needs to do and like things work. Um, so luckily, this is actually possible today. Uh, there's a fantastic crate called uh, Postgres, Ma uh, Postgres Mapper. Um, and it works via procedural macros. So if you attach a derived procedural macro, it'll actually expose a function call from Postgres row. And that simply takes a Postgres row object. Um, when you query, it returns a row object. It will try to convert that to the user data. And instead of just one time like, panicking, it'll actually return a result for you. So you are forced to deal with any errors that happen, um, which is which is actually great, so it's not gonna just panic out of nowhere. Uh, and additionally, uh, there's another attribute you can add. Uh, this is something I actually added to the crate, so I'm quite proud of this. Um, it will provide to you just uh, field names and uh, table names. So the table name is just extracts from that attribute, um, and the field names, it'll just take all the field names and uh, contact that and make that a string. 
Uh, so it is possible to write code such as this uh, and have this be maintained over time because if you add new fields to your uh, struct, uh, it's th these functions are automatically going to be updated um, and you don't have this like crazy maintenance issue over time. Um, if you find yourself, uh, caveat here, if you find yourself uh, querying for maybe like fewer fields than what was in your struct, I suggest you make a new struct. Uh, so almost a uh, struct per query uh, sort of model uh, rather than trying to hack something together. Cool. So uh, since we uh, have some benefits of uh, the procedural macro helping us out, uh, there's still probably more testing we can do. And I actually found that I needed to do that uh, when I was sort of changing my uh, schemas for my databases. So I decided to write integration tests. Um, and this is actually uh, inspired by a blog post. I'm not sure uh, which one it is. So if anyone knows, uh, I'd love to credit them. Um, but all this is doing, it's, it's setting up the database, um, it's running a test, and it's tearing it down. And it's using this uh, panic catch unwind function to actually uh, test, um, check if the test uh, that you're running uh, panics, and it'll catch that, and it'll convert that to a result. Um, and at the end of this, you can just assert that if that result was okay or not. And this allows you to sort of do the setup and tear down uh, before that. Um, there are a lot of caveats to the catch and wind. Uh, as a doxa, you should probably not be using it as a uh, try-catch. Um, so in languages, other languages is like a try-catch. Um, in test, however, I believe this should be okay. Um, additionally, catch and wind will not catch all kinds of panics. Um, you should, again, read the docs, um, but I believe in this code it should be okay. Um, and the, you can see in Maybe you can see in the below, I'm essentially testing one of my functions, uh, which is the actual function, the actual query I wrote. Um, and so I can verify that it actually returns something uh, that I expect it does. Cool, so let's take a look at what the setup function does, because I think actually this is pretty interesting. So um, uh, I'll sort of read through this if it's hard to read. Uh, essentially, we are trying to connect to an actual Postgres database. So we need a real Postgres instance to connect to. Um, this means that we're actually going to be testing against something that hopefully we're going to be seeing in production. So it mirrors our production environment quite nicely. Uh, we then create a uh, database. Uh, and the reason for that is that if you don't create a a new database per test, you're going to have to wait for each test to complete, uh, run your test in single thread, and that's going to take a very, very long time. However, since these are sort of for just tests, uh, I decided that it was okay to create a database uh, and just run all the tests in parallel and runs pretty quickly that way. And then tear down script is simply drop database, so the cleaning process also becomes very nice and easy. Um, and then finally, uh, remember the migration scripts we had before? Well, we can use those same exact migration scripts um, to actually populate and like uh, create our database schema. Um, I also have a migration script called fake data that I was using for development. Uh, you don't need that as a migration script, but you can use those same sort of um, migration scripts uh, to sort of make sure that you're testing against the same database that you assume you're gonna have in production. Um, and you can actually use this kind of model to test migrations themselves. So uh, set up all your migrations, uh, apply the new migration, make sure things are okay, things don't break. Um, so the, this probably has applications beyond just uh, testing your SQL queries. Uh, one caveat here, again, is that ideally you probably want a in-memory Postgres instance, so you're not dependent on like a third-party um, third party connection or network connection. Um, if someone knows how to set that up, I would love to talk to you. Um, cool. Next, I want to take a look at logging. Uh, this deserves a talk on itself, so I'm going to actually touch upon a couple of concepts you should be thinking about when approaching this. Um, and for that, I'm gonna be using the S-Log crate. Um, S-Log is a fantastic crate. It's actually, I would say, more of a framework than a single implementation. Um, and it does that by exposing a couple of traits. And the trait that, um, one of the traits that is useful for actually formatting um, how you output and store your data is the drain trait. And you can use this to sort of specify, uh, okay, I want a uh, JSON formatter or I want a plain text formatter. And this might be hard to read, but 
Actually, I'm asserting at the top that at debug, uh, config debug assertion, which essentially means in debug or development mode, uh, just output this as plain text. Uh, but uh, in release mode, actually format this as JSON, and um, hopefully the JSON is going to be a lot more useful for the logging backend you guys are using. Similarly, you can specify async versus sync, um, and you can also specify uh, file versus sort of shipping these logs off to a network. And all these things are just backed by the drain trait, so it's also possible to write your own implementation for whatever you might need. Cool, so the next thing I wanna say is that you should probably be making your logs uh, structured. Um, and what structured really means uh, is the log should be machine searchable. So rather than having a whole glob of uh, plain text logs that you now have to maybe write a complex regex query to like filter and search on something, uh, you should have them as key value pairs. Um, and the key value pairs can then be used to filter and search your logs. So an example might be um, give me all uh, errors that are associated with uh, release 102, uh, or give me all errors that are associated with HTTP code error like 500, uh, or even like give me all errors associated with the particular request ID if you are tagging that. And then lastly, uh, logs should be contextual, uh, which means that you should um, be adding tags in context to the code path that you're hitting. Uh, what this means is that as you're passing these, um, uh, your logger, your, your logger instance is what you're gonna be passing through your code. Uh, these, ta these tags and contacts actually add up, end up being additive. So you have a trace of, um, okay, it hit my server path, and then it hit my backend path, and then it hit my like, data path, and this is where it erred. So I now know uh, I got a network error, and it was uh, in my data uh, layer, not my server layer. It's going to make it easier to debug. Um, and S-Log uh, out of the box sort of supports that because the uh, logger instance supposedly is quite cheap uh, to clone. Um, uh, it's actually doing a pretty, uh, it looks like a clone on like a, all the key values, so I don't know how light that is. Um, so you maybe want to benchmark that yourself. Um, but according to documentations, they're relatively cheap to clone and are additive. Uh, I do want to mention that when I wrote this, um, a crate called, a uh, new framework called tracing was not available. Uh, tracing uh, also looks like a fantastic option. Uh, tracing out of the box is meant for distributed tracing uh, or distributed logging, uh, and it's not necessarily only for microservices. Uh, distributed tracing is also really good for asynchronous code uh, because you can't uh, predict uh, when your execution, what next execution is going to be, uh, and your execution context sort of interleave. Um, it attaches request IDs and uh, keeps, uh, allows you to sort of uh, do that in, asynchronous, uh, in an asynchronous application as well as a microservice application. Uh, so take a look at that as well. Uh, and lastly, um, I was really, really um, confused why there wasn't line numbers when, um, when I had my log. So I decided to use the line macro uh, and create sort of a simple, um, syntax macro to just wrap that in. Uh, and all this is doing is, is taking um, the error uh, macro and just wrapping that and attaching the line macro functionality. So my logs now have line numbers and I can easily tell which line in my code actually um, caused the error. And this works because the syntax macro is actually uh, compiled or uh, converted to code at compile time, so the line actually ends up matching with where this is used. All right, so let's uh, look at some code hardening tips. Um, this is more about just error handling, um, and this might be general knowledge, but uh, this, these are some things that I found are actually uh, help me make um, saner code. <laughs> Uh, so one of the things is that you should probably be declaring a global app error enum. Um, and within this enum, you should be declaring all the different types of errors you can possibly see in your app. Uh, so for me, that's included something like uh, not logged in or database error or not found error. Um, secondly, you should be uh, creating a type alias for your error result. Um, so the result can be, the success can be returning anything, and the error should be forced to return your app error, the fin error in my case. And then lastly, you should be enforcing that anything that returns a result 
returns the app result. And what this is going to do is that it's going to significantly reduce the um, API that the error error API that you need to deal with. So uh, you no longer have to worry about all the different kinds of errors that different crates and different libraries that you're using are going to create. You only need to worry about um, the fin or the app error that you are dealing with in your app. So the function, let's say example, is that a function is doing a SQL query. Uh, it could produce maybe a malform SQL exception, or maybe uh, it times out as it's causing a network exception you no longer have to worry about that. The function is responsible for converting that into a fin error. Uh, and in this case, maybe a database error is what's most relevant. Uh, and you only have to deal with those errors now. So uh, the point of this is that you're reducing the surface area of your errors that you're dealing with. Uh, and lastly, uh, I found this um, to be good practice. Uh, sort of wrapping um, your errors, uh, so the errors you return to your users, wrapping that into a struct. Uh, and adding two fields at the very least. Um, and there's, there's a balance here. So there's a code part to it and there's a message part to it. The code part is what you're gonna be using uh, for, develop, uh, for developer. Uh, it's, it's information for the developer. So uh, things you can use to sort of extract of what actually happened. And the message is uh, information for the user. Uh, the balance is because for the user, you probably want to provide them uh, just enough information to tell them what's going on and how to resolve it. You don't want to dive into deeper of like, this is what happened because of this happened and this failed. Uh, with the code uh, point of this, you probably want to express as much information so it becomes easy to debug when they come back to you um, and they report to customer service that this went wrong and this is the code. Uh, an example of this is that you can see at the bottom maybe, or not, uh, there are two types of errors that cause the same error message. So a database error or a server error will cause the message an error occurred with the service. Uh, it's pretty generic, and the user shouldn't have to care about what happened because there's no way to recover this, really. Uh, this is system error um, that is going on with your system, so there's really not much they can do with it. Uh, they should probably return a 500. Uh, however, the code of these two things are different. So the server error is 20, the database error are 25, and these are just values I picked, but with this code, it's easy to tell, um, okay, so the server error happened, um, something's wrong with my system, or a database error happened, okay, my database might be down, I should go check that out. Um, and that's it for my talk, but let's see if we have some more time. Um, if, I don't know if we have time for, we have three minutes, uh, I don't know if we have any more questions, but uh, again, you can't see that URL, but um, uh, this is my information, and I'm pretty sure these slides are gonna be available online, so uh, feel free to uh, contact me.